Good evening, everyone. The time is now 5.02 p.m. and the Belt Independent School District Board of Trustees are now convening a workshop on Monday, March 25th, 2024. A quorum of board members is present. Please note that Ms. Bass is not here. She had to attend to a personal matter. This meeting has been duly called and notice of the meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. Any public comments, Becca? No? Let's move on to item three. Board workshop. Up All right. President Alcozer and members of the board, um, we're going to invite Melissa Lafferty and Todd Schiller to come up and join us for our conversation. The purpose of our conversation tonight is really to engage in a discussion and regarding preliminary um, assessment of our budget outlook, um, both for this year and moving into next year and also talk about some of our market competitiveness. So we are <coughs> launching the budget process in this workshop. And so Melissa is going to kick us off and going to talk timeline with us and then start getting into some of the details that make up our budget. All right, y'all ready to start it? Mm -hmm. Is it on? Sure. Sorry. Okay, Becca, do you mind um, advancing it for us? And then, okay, thank you. All right, so tonight we're going to kind of talk through some of the um, you know, we had a legislative session and kind of talked through um, the implications to not only this year's budget, but as we get ready to plan for the 24-25 budget. Uh, tonight I want to walk you through real quickly the budget timeline. Um, and of course tonight we're going to ask you to, we're going to go over our, our budget assumptions as we start planning for the 24-25 year and ask you to approve those assumptions tonight at the board meeting. Um, in April, the appraisal district will send us um, our preliminary taxable values, and that will give us a good estimate of what that value growth is for the current year, and kind of gets us a step closer to determining what that funding may look like going into the school year. And of course, by June, hopefully have um, a compensation plan figured out and a, uh, approved. And then, of course, as we go into July, you know, we get our certified values, and then we know for sure what our our tax collections will be based on those values. And then um, as we progress into August, of course, we need to adopt in our tax rate and our budget. Okay, <coughs> All right, so everyone in the room knows what affects our funding. Of course, it's enrollment and what goes hand in hand with enrollment is the attendance. Um, and as you can see there, historically, um, We've had enrollment growth every year, and then there in 2022, we had this spike of about 5.7% growth in enrollment, and then it's kind of declined, and now it's beginning to level off, uh, not only in the current year for 23-24, but also projected going into the 24-25 and 25-26 budget years. So again, that affects you know any increase in our funding. Now, it's not enrollment that we are funded on. Uh, we all know that it's based on the attendance. And prior to COVID, um, we had an attendance percentage that was greater than 95%. And that was about standard across the state, 95 to 96%. Um, as we approached 2021, that's when COVID hit. And you can see there, there was an attendance rate of about 94.8%. And the reason why it was so high during that period is because the state was holding us harmless because um, we didn't have kids in classrooms. Um, and so they were just trying to hold us harmless so we didn't take a big hit to our funding because we just didn't have the attendance. And then it continued to decline into 22. It, it dipped down, but we've done a lot of work here at the district to try to increase that rate. Um, and you see that we are starting to rebound back up. And right now for the current year, we're sitting at about 94% attendance. Um, 
And so one thing to note when it comes to our funding, if we could raise that rate another 1%, um, that's an additional $1 million in additional revenue to our funding. Okay. This graph right here just kind of shows the relationship and you can see the correlation between that enrollment and the attendance. And you can see early on in the early years, they correlated for the most part, but then you can kind of see where that attendance is dipping. Um, and there's a wider gap, and that just kind of gives you a visual. But for the 2000, for the current year, 2023-24, uh, and then going into 24-25 next year's budget, you can see our enrollment's beginning to level off, and then we could use just a little bit of bump there in that attendance uh, if we could get that up to closer to 95% to correlate a little better. <coughs> So um, this slide right here is just to show, you know, our enrollment growth from year to year, and then the board has continued to apply uh, to give raises. Um, there in 2019-20, that was House Bill 3, and we were, all districts across the state were required to give larger raises to those teachers um, because of that additional increase in the basic allotment, and then you can see we continue to give raises each year. And here, what I want to show you, just historically, so you can kind of get a bird's eye view and, and kind of get um, a visual of basically where we, when we originally budget, and then when we, where we land uh, at the end of the year, which is our actual. So the top section of this chart is basically our original budget at adoption, and then what that, the change to fund balance when you adopted that budget, and then just be, directly below each year is going to be where we actually came in uh, with revenue and expenditures when it was all said and done. And you can see there, um, and we'll move up to about 2022. In 2022, um, we adopted a $5.2 million deficit. Again, most of that was our vacancy factor. and. Uh, we realized only a $275,000 deficit. So we were almost balanced in that 2022 year. And then last year, we adopted a $4.2 million deficit. Now we have some stimulus funding that we were utilizing to help hold that in check. Um, again, there's no vacancy factor built into that original budget. So when we originally budgeted, that was our vacancy factor of $4.2 million, $4 million, and then last year we came in just almost a million to the good uh, on the change to fund balance. As does, we, he, does anyone have questions on vacancy factor, what Melissa's talking about with vacancy factor? We'll get there. Okay. Okay. And of course, um, for the 2023-24, You'll recall we built in a vacancy factor of about $4 million, and that's basically um, positions that we have budgeted, but because of the turnover um, and people leaving, we don't pay everything we budget in those salaries. Um, so that's already built into this year's budget. We had additional uh, positions that, were at, that we had moved temporarily out to the stimulus funding. Um, have come back into the general fund and we ended up adopting that $5 million deficit. As you go below uh, for the revised budget for the current year, we will talk through what has happened there, but you can see um, right now we're projecting around an almost $11.9 million deficit and we're going to talk through those implications here in the next few slides. So what you need to understand as we begin our budget process, you know, everything is always a projection. Um, when we're determining what our funding is going to be, we're projecting. Uh, when we determine what our payroll is going to be, we're projecting. When we're trying to determine what those uh, taxable values are, we are projecting. When it's all said and done, we truly don't know what our revenues are until we've already started our next budget cycle. We'll already be on our next school year when I realize exactly what our revenues are going to be. So, and when do those normally come in, Melissa? Is that November, October? The the state values. The state. So there's well, we'll get into state values, but yes. So we, um, you know, we get our certified values in July, and so that we do know, and then they submit those values to the comptroller, and so we're funded on two different 
values, right? There's a the appraisal district's values on certified value, and then the state also, the state funding is driven by what the comptroller says our state value is. Um, we don't know those values until February, so we're always having to project what that state value is. Generally, they correlate, um, but this year with that increase in homestead exemption and some of the, the statutes that were passed, you're going to see that it drastically changed some things for us uh, in that projection. One of the other struggles we have is just determining what's our enrollment growth going to be. Um, and you can see there, this graph here is just to show you that the demographer does a really good job and he gets really close on what our enrollment is. But you can see there for the 23-24 year, um, he was projecting an enrollment of a 13,994. We're actually sitting at about 138. Um, and so when we budgeted, uh, we budgeted for 180 additional kids that just didn't uh, enroll into our system. So what we're doing for the 24, 25 years, we're going to take a more conservative approach. Um, I think he's going to give us projections, I believe, next month. Yeah. Um, but for now, we're using uh, his latest projections. And so these numbers that I'm going to be showing you is basically we're going to um, use an enrollment growth of 100 students uh, to plan next year's revenue. So we're still growing, but that growing is slow it's to about 1% right now. Right. Okay. Quick question. What, so. uh, what's the qualification for being a fast growth school district? So um, there's different levels that they put you into for fast growth. We have dropped uh, one level. Um, so we were a three, now we're a two. Um, <coughs> fast growth allotment. And so we're seeing a decrease in the fast growth allotment. We're no longer... Uh, growing at the rate we were previously. What's the, what's the difference in the levels? Um, I knew that that uh, that one level drop for us was approximately a million and a half dollars. Dollars total. Mm -hmm. yes. What is that? Is it sort of basic basic allotment is it goes up a little bit as you go up in tiers of fast growth. Uh, no, it's a it's basically kind it's of a on? weight yeah. that they, yeah it's a weight that they add okay. on. All right, back up. So what we're doing to get to that 100 student growth is taking the demographer's projection. I'm reducing that 13,000 uh, by about 0.6% to get us to a 100 student growth. You can, using about a 92% attendance uh, percentage would put us at an ADA of 12,788 as we budget for the 24-25 year. For 23-24, our ADA at the time uh, we built the presentation, we were sitting at an ADA of 12,681. So it just tells the story of, if we think about our legislative priorities that you adopted last year in wanting our legislature um, to consider funding based on enrollment <coughs> versus based on ADA. And so this tells the story of why that's an important legislative priority for us. And districts across the state. Listen, what did you say? Did you say that? Uh, <coughs> what did you anticipate? What did you budget for in terms of, of average daily attendance? Ninety-six percent for. Um, for twenty-four, twenty-five. So yeah, there's a difference. This the ninety-one point eight seven percent or ninety-one point eight percent you're seeing here mm -hmm. is that's not refined ADA. So okay. the, if you were to take the, let's say 2425, the 12,788 would be considered refined ADA, and that would be an attendance rate of about 94%. Okay. So um, the 91.8% is if you took the 12,788 in ADA as the numerator and put it on top of your enrollment, that is the 91.8%. So you're just creating a, a fraction of that ADA over the enrollment. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about taxable values. And I think earlier I, I was telling you that with, there's two sets of values that drives our funding. Um, and we're going to go ahead and go straight to the 2024 adopted, which you can see there. The red is the certified values and the gray is state values. 
and you can see over time they, they generally correlate. State values come in a little less and that's because they account for the freeze um, and other uh, exemptions differently than our, what we base our collections on. Melissa, will you explain, does everybody know what the freeze is? Okay, because that, that term okay. didn't come up a lot today. So, so well. yeah, there, you know, if you're over 65 and you qualify, um, you, they freeze your values. Okay, so um, it's kind of, they're kind of accounted for separately than the, the rest of us that are paying, you know, taxes on basically the value of our homes. Okay, so, um, and what's affecting us this year is going to be that over 65, and I'm going to go into more detail here in a second. But I, what I want you to understand is there's two, there's two sets of, of values that drive funding. Our certified values determines our collection. So we're able to get to that number um, by basically taking our tax rate, applying it to a, you know, taxable values, and then dividing that by 100, and that's your collections. The over 65 uh, popu uh, taxpayers, their taxes are frozen, so I can't get to that number <coughs> by just doing a calculation. I have to rely on the appraisal district to give me that number on what their actual tax levy is going to be because they freeze it and then there's calculations that they have to do to give us that number. So, um, but what drives our state funding is, so when the TEA sends us our state funding, they look only at the state comptroller's values. And so the appraisal district will uh, certify values and then they'll go through their ARBs and everybody's protesting and then in about no, October, November, they begin submitting that data to the state comptroller's office, and all of that data gets submitted, all those values go into the state comptroller's office, and then they do a property value study to make sure that appraisal districts are valuing properties at market value, which is uh, state law. And then in the, right at about the 1st of February, then the comptroller's office will give us our preliminary state values. And that's what drives the state funding formulas uh, for our foundation money. So we adopt a budget in August based right. on certified values that we have in July. And then it's not until February of that year. So over halfway through the year, we're we get that state, value. state values then that tell us it, how close we were. Right. Okay. Right. And historically, those have generally correlated, but there was a big, huge change in the homestead exemption. So um, the 2024 adopted, uh, you can see there, the certified values and the state value. That's where we adopted our budget. Okay. But when you go one, two sets of bars to the left, the 2024 current, that's based on what we know today and what happened to values in regards to that increase in the $100,000 homestead exemption. And you'll see the impact of that on our budget yes. in a couple more slides. Right. So. right. so we had no way of knowing what that impact was going to be. And we're going to see that the biggest the biggest impact it had was on the over 65 levy, okay, which is a number we could not get to. Now, you have to remember, the appraisal districts were doing their thing, the legislative session was happening, um, they determined they wanted to go to 100,000, so, you know, naturally when you got to August and everybody's adopting budgets, appraisal districts trying to get their heads wrapped around it, we were trying to get our heads wrapped around it. Um, and so when they make that big of a significant change in law, it takes, you know, school finance folks a little while to catch up because softwares have to change, calculations have to change, and what does that look like? Okay, back up. All right, so I just wanted to show you, y'all, you usually see this, uh, I present this quite often, it's just a change in local value from year to year. Um, and last year, you can see there that from the 2000, over the 2022 year to 2023, we grew 20.7% just with a 40, increase to a 40,000 homestead exemption. However, that 100,000 homestead exemption didn't see quite the growth uh, uh, that we were expecting. So, of course, it was only at 8.6. But now that we know and all the values are in and all the protests are over, the appraisal district 
it dropped another, you know, 3.2 percent uh, in growth from the 2023 year. I'm projecting, which is going to be one of our budget assumptions, is that for the for next year's budget for the 2025 uh, property value growth will increase about eight percent. I think it, you know, will start climbing back up from there. Okay, so here's that change in tax levy. Again, when we adopted our budget, um, the freeze adjusted tax is your normal uh, property value times our tax rate divided by 100. So that, that change in levy was about 2.3 million with the increase in the homestead exemption. With the over 65, you can see there, the over 65 tax certified at certification and adoption we were estimating that over 65 freeze tax to be 8.4 million as of february 1st when we knew kind of how everything landed you can see there it's almost a 50 percent reduction in that over 65 levy so basically it decreased our tax collections levy by about 6.7 million that is for both the general fund and the debt service so that's the total tax rate uh, together, okay. So both funds. That's the total change in levy that we um, did not anticipate. And again, due to the increase in that homestead exemption. That's, some of that over sixty-five, right? Was they went back retroactively? Yes. Three yeah. years. And so part right. of that. So, that's correct. Yeah, it's not a one-year mm -hmm. hit. This right. is like three-year surprise. Here you go, guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. My, my parents <clears throat> seemed to think they were surprised. It looked as though. It, at first that they had no property. Yeah, some had no property And they did not understand level. it. And they were like, well, that's not right. They actually said, we've been paying taxes. We want to continue to support our community. Why would we just suddenly not pay taxes? Anymore? So they, the over 65 folks enjoyed the hundred, the increase in homestead exemption <coughs> to 100,000. And then the, um, since 2019, when they started compressing our tax rates, the over 65 population did not get the benefit of the tax compression. So the appraisal districts had to go back three years to 2019 and give them that benefit, so retroactively. So that's why it didn't seem right. A lot of them had zero balances uh, when it was all said and done. So will that change then going forward? They will start paying some? Yeah, so now it should start leveling off and going back to normal. That was just that one time getting caught up because yeah, they didn't I get that. I just thought they got to be wrong. They have to be wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wrong. I had no idea it was going to have this kind of impact <laughs> on the collections. And, and, and you know, you and, and Chris and I have talked about this. The problem is that we set our budget based on the certified values that we were given. We were also told by the state when they did the compression that the schools would be held harmless, meaning right hey, whatever we do to compression, we're going to make up the difference. Well, we're well almost $7 million in the difference, and there is no state coming in to say, sorry, it was our mistake. Here's your money. The states, uh, I emailed the representative. Uh, Dr. Buckley just asked him, could he give me information before the meeting tonight? And, I haven't, and that was last week. I haven't heard back that the state is going to throw any school districts, <coughs> excuse me, a lifeline because these are, it's not Belton ISD didn't spend money we didn't have. We spent the money that the state told us we would have, and now the state said, oh, sorry, we don't have that money. Well, right. There's another one coming, too. And we are appealing this. Um, we don't know the impact of that appeal and what that will have for us, but we are appealing this. And I think also it's important to note that um, the, you know, it's, it's always February when we get the state values, but historically, they're not that off. Mm -hmm. um, this was an anomaly that happened this year. And again, um, when you cut your over 65 mm -hmm. um, levy in half, it's going to have an impact on the budget. We're, lit, we're almost three quarters of the way through right now. And it's not our local appraisal district. They were doing, because every, I mean, they were doing what every appraisal district was doing. Somewhere in the state of Texas, somebody realized, oh, wow. We haven't been given this benefit for the last three years to the over 65 freeze. So they went back to every appraisal district. They're like, yeah, we forgot to tell you this. Now you go back in your communities and, and figure out what you need to do. Which yeah, is, so all yeah. districts were affected in their levies. So yes. Melissa, yeah. make sure I understand this. So, oh, so this back, is the almost $7 million, that's a, that's a direct impact from the homestead exemption. Is, is that? 
Homestead mm -hmm. exemption and them retroactively. Right, right, that. right. And right. So we're short. We're short almost seven million because of that. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Yeah. But wait, there's more. It gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> yes. no, sorry. Yeah. I anticipate that. Yeah. <laughs> Another mistake was made that we're going to. Um, the next slide is is not a mistake. It's the implications of our ESSER funding. We mm -hmm. knew would ultimately go away. And Melissa will talk you through the slide very quickly, but this is a slide directly from all of the trainings we attended with TEA on how they guided school districts in their use of ESSER funds. And so you want to just briefly. So if you just quickly look at the, at the graph, um, you can see the blue and the orange, and you can see that they're pretty much, you know, level, right? And so that's your, your collections. Um, and then of course state funding and then the, the, the bars on top is going to be that stimulus funding, the ESSER 1 there in 20, uh, in 21, we got the ESSER 2, and then of course the ESSER 3. Uh, TEA, uh, based on their guidance, was saying beware of that funding cliff. Um, in other words, be conservative with this money, is what they were telling districts across the state, so that you could get through the next biennium. Um, and you told us that. I remember yeah. you talking about the cliff. Right, yeah, right. And then we had teacher shortages and inflation and all those things happened. So, and so I think all of us statewide, uh, you know, are, are feeling, feeling this that. Absolutely. And how this benefited us is it allowed us through, we had a lot of impact of COVID. And so it allowed us during this time period to keep our class sizes smaller than they normally were. So that, that was a huge benefit for us making it through COVID and the after effects of COVID for those years. Okay, so this graph right here is kind of tells the story. The green line is our enrollment. So you can see uh, from 2021 up to about 2023, we were growing. Um, the blue uh, bars is going to be the fund balance for each year, and the gray bar is the uh, actual revenue or the current revenue and then the purple is what we were anticipating um, and where you really see that difference is going to be in the 2024-25 uh, years and then of course red is going to be the expenditures so as we move over towards the right to 2024 in the current year you know we were anticipating more revenue than what we're getting um, and we expected a, you know, a $5 million deficit because we adopted that. So you can kind of see there, there's a little bit of, of a gap between those expenditures and what we were anticipating. But the gray bar, you know, we dropped below what we were anticipating in our revenues um, and then what that impact is. So the drop in that fund balance would be that difference in the revenue the gray bar to the, the red bar, which is our expenditures. So again, so I, think, I think this tells the story. It's been pretty, pretty consistent over the years in the expenditures, anticipated um, revenue, and then the current revenue. And you see fund balance stayed relatively stable during that time. So you start to see the impact on fund balance based on that plus a few more factors we're going to talk about in a minute hitting the 23-24 budget and then of course we'll talk 25 in a little bit all right here i wanted to show you historically uh, the effect on fund balance and then you know our policy is to stay uh, between 20 and 25 percent on our fund balance percentage um, and you can <laughs> see back there in 2012 uh, back when things were grim and districts were um, having budgetary constraints at that time also, you can see that Belton ISD uh, had dipped down to around 18% in their fund balance back in 2012. But then as you move uh, into the future years, you can see that, that that then rebounded. Okay, so this isn't something that's new to us. It's just um, at some points in time, the state kind of gives us a hiccup and a reset button. And that's kind of where we're at. Uh, well, but I think our situation was different. If you were here in 2011 during that time period, um, the funding for there were lawsuits over the funding formula for public education. Um, the state's um, budget was in a different place, very different than today. Today we have a pretty robust and significant, I think that's fair to say, surplus in our state budget. 
That was not necessarily the case then. So it was a little bit different situation, but again, school districts were faced with a significant um, decrease in revenue, um, yet they were growing, and that's, you know, Felton was not immune to that, and that's why you see that dip to the 18%. Yeah, I mean, and just like our situation now, though, and when we went back and historically looked at this, because we wanted to get an idea, we knew we'd been through this before, none of us were on board, but 11 was a bad year, and in fact, so we went back and said, let's look historically, well, 11 would be like we are today, everything looks fine, and then 12 hits, and the implications, and I, I believe it was 11, when the state pulled $5 billion from the Texas Education Foundation to balance the budget for the state of Texas. So like I said, different, they've never put that money back, by the way, they've kept it out. But, and that was when they slashed, they, they did, they slashed funding. Uh, mm -hmm. Different than it's now, now it's based on basically miscalculations the state has made, that, but it's gonna be the same impact on us. That the amount of money we're receiving, even though we're growing, is gonna be a lot less yeah. than what we would have, what yeah. did have. So this year wasn't a slash in funding, it was no funding. This year was there in all of the legislative, the legislative session and well, then all the session, special yeah. called sessions, yeah. there was no change no to the basic allotment, no funding. No, and, no inflation or anything. Right. So, so and all for, I can't remember the basic allotment changing since when, was it 2000? Was it 2019? It, it, House Bill 3, 2019, 19, yeah. and up to that point it hadn't changed till since 2016. And so since then they don't oh, increase wow. basic allotment yeah. very often. So and since then we've had unprecedented inflation About rate. About a 19% inflation rate. Yeah. So. All right, okay. so um, have to watch uh, this is our current budget situation. We kind of talked through that freeze collections. Um, so to the general fund, uh, it was basically four point, I believe that's six million, um, my glasses are reading correctly, basically a reduction of 4.6 million in collections uh, to our local revenues. Um, then when you net that with, uh, we conservatively budgeted our interest earnings, and then of course we closed that stadium revenue bond uh, fund, um, and so those athletic revenues are now being accounted for in our local budget. Uh, so when you net that together, um, you can see there is about a $3 million decrease to our local. Uh, our enrollment did not come in at what we had projected when we budgeted originally, so that's about another $1 million in less revenue. And then um, the state of Texas, um, a, right before Christmas break, um, sent us a notice to say, hey, we've lost uh, two appeals uh, with the OIG in our Medicaid, so we get reimbursed for Medicaid services that we provide for special education students. Um, and we had filed a cost report anticipating about $2.3 million um, in reimbursements that we would be getting this year. And the state retroactively, because they lost their appeal with the, the federal, federal government, government retroactively came in and told us basically, you know, we had already budgeted for about that 2.3 million and said, well, you're only gonna see about 800,000 uh, in funding out of that reimbursement. Now, we are fighting that. Uh, we're in our second layer of appeals on that one also um, and not sure where that's going to land, but they will not settle us out until all of that's kind of wrapped up, so. But again, it goes, but it does, I think, support for the, you know, we've talked through this, I had, that educate me on the charge stuff. You know, the districts were advised by the state of Texas slash TEA, here are the things that you need to spend this money on. So every district followed the advice of the state and TEA, spent it, and then the federal government came and said, Texas, where you're spending this is wrong. We didn't do anything wrong, we did what we were told, but now the state of Texas, instead of, you know, making us whole, they're going back to every school district and saying, well, sorry, we know you gave the advice, but we're taking that money uh, back. So this, and I think y'all have seen news articles, this hit districts all across our state. Yep. So ours was around 1.2. Um, there are other <coughs> districts that saw um, even significantly higher reductions. And so, but still a surprise. Again, adopted the budget in August and we're getting that information mid-year this year. Right. And it impacts this year's budget and beyond. Would y'all remind us what SHAR stands for? Mm -hmm. uh, school Health and Related Services. Hey, Melissa, uh, not ago and mentioned the appeal earlier, and now there's another appeal with this Medicaid. So is that essentially statewide? Is it 
all districts, or are there some yes. districts that were not affected? Or? Um, it's most districts, not everybody, because uh, um, they may have a, a shared service arrangement. So not all districts are directly get reimbursements. Kind of depends on where you're at, but almost nearly all the districts, right. everybody um, got the letter. So, so tell us about the process. I mean, who, who's appealing that for us, and, and who and, and who hears the appeal? So there was. Um, Right before Christmas break, they sent us the notice, hey, you're I wearing your that. funding. Mm -hmm. So we filed an informal review uh, just with last, uh, with uh, Health and Human Services of okay. the state. The state, okay. Yes, sir. And so um, just last week, everybody got the standard denial letter from HHSC, I call them HHSC, Health and Human Services. We got the standard denial letter. We have since now basically filed for a formal appeal. So that goes to a different um, committee for them to look at that. And Still so, in the same agency? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, so, and is that the end of the road or is it? Uh, we're waiting to, to see where that, I don't know, we don't know where that's going to land. Okay. Um, will they hold us harmless? Will they change, you know, I, we don't know what that's. Is that something but that, they have that encouraged you, us to go ahead and file that. Appeal. Are you doing that? Yes, sir. We already have. Okay. No, I mean, you're the one that's, that's doing that for the district. Yes. Right. Um, I, we have a third party um, service provider that helps us with our SHARs um, and helps us with our ratios that, that apply to that reimbursement. And so they have attorneys that will help represent us uh, when we do go to a formal appeal, if we get called to a formal appeal. Okay. So, um, and then the other, Melinda, you had mentioned the, another appeal. And what was that? What, tell me about that one. The other appeal is to the comptroller, the state comptroller, mm -hmm. and that's in regards to our state values. Right. And right. so, with the homestead exemption, yes, and all that. Right? So something is out of alignment in those state values compared to the values that we know today. And so, uh, our tax collections attorneys, MBBA, has filed a protest, basically an adjustment to the state to try to get those adjusted. And that's going to be, uh, we're saying basically that. Um, our state values need to decrease 175 million, which would increase funding for us. And that could potentially be about an additional two million. So the number I'm showing here on our current budget of 11.9 million, if we win that protest, we won't know that answer until August. Um, it could put us around 10 million deficit instead of the almost 12. Any indication of what if we will win it or if we could win it, it was the chance of It's always the state. You know, so that's if we're successful state. on both appeals, you say? Just, just, yeah, one. just be no, the that would just be the state controllers. Okay. Okay. Which is the, the homestead exemption piece. Yes. Right? Yes. And then yes. the other was the... The other is the Medicaid services. Medicaid services. Okay. So with respect to the homestead, is that also just this huge number of districts? Or <coughs> is it statewide or...? Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of us met, most of us got hit on that freeze levy. So, you know, I've talked with superintendents um, in the Dallas area, San Antonio area, Austin area, um, locally, and so we are not alone in what's happening. You're seeing districts discovering lower state values. They knew about the SHARs that surprised districts across the state earlier. Um, so you are starting to hear the implications for this year's budget in terms of greater deficit budgets. Many districts adopted a deficit budget this year. Um, most were hoping for some relief at the legislative level because of the impact on inflation, utilities costs, gas prices, all, all of those things are supplies and goods that impacts us as well. Um, but that didn't happen. So many of us are realizing a deficit budget this year and projecting for a deficit budget next year. So we're going to have to keep moving because we've got to get to okay, yeah. Todd's. <laughs> so we're going to quickly just, this is kind of looking into next year's budget and our early projections of what that revenue may look like. Again, only uh, anticipating 100 students in growth. Um, we will be utilizing and burning up, basically, the remaining ESSER funds in this current school year. And so there's about $3.3 in positions that are out there being funded federally that will have to come back into next year's budget. Uh, to increase that payroll. But basically, these numbers here is taking uh, the expenditures we had when we budgeted in August 
and just bringing those over into the 24-25. So these numbers have not been increased for anticipated increases in utilities or anything like that. That's just trying to hold expenditures flat uh, compared to when we originally budgeted. And you can see there, um, that would give us, potentially give us about a $13 million, we'd be looking at a $13 million budget deficit um, and then what that effect is on fund balance. And that assumes that we realize the full $11 million um, deficit yes. this year. Yes. So obviously if we don't realize that full amount, then that 10% will go up, assuming we adopted a budget the same as this year. Is that right? So if nothing changed, yes. we didn't so get we raises. So we realized that $12 million deficit and then budgeted and, and realized a $13 million, that would put us at 10% of fund balance. That would reduce it to 10%. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are strategies that we have been looking at. And I'm going to start on the revenue side, and then I'm going to jump to the expenditure, expenditure reduction side of it. Um, you, you can see the list. I um, want to jump to a couple. One, the attendance one. We have continued to work really hard on attendance, and we'll continue those efforts. Um, as Melissa said, for about every 1% and um, attendance, it's about an additional million dollars. Um, CTE courses, um, that is weighted funding. We get more funding, so really looking at are we maximizing what we can do in the area of CTE. Um, advertising fees, we did put that in there. That's not going to get us much money, but we could increase. Um, we do some advertising at Tiger Field, things like that, so we could do that. Um, we could go out for a Vader, a voter approved tax rate election. Um, Melissa can um, talk to you about, I believe we've already had, it was called a TRE if you were on the board when um, Belton did that um, several years ago. I believe we have, I think it's around 3.17 pennies left that we could, could utilize out of the available pennies. Um, but that would take a voter approved election, so, um, and it would get us about, if we went out for that and we were successful, somewhere around 3.5 million um, additional funding in, on the M&O side. Um, we've already talked about SHARs and um, just making sure that we're coding underneath their new rules um, to the maximum extent we can to get as many dollars there as we can talked about CCMR and then we're going to be doing a PEMS audit to make sure that we're coding every student um, accurately we haven't missed anything so that's um, a strategy we're going to use just to ensure that um, again we're not leaving any dollars on the table by miscoding someone so we're just going to do an audit and see I don't know that that's going to get us much but we want to make sure on expenditure reduction side um, as y'all know, the reason I'm jumping to that side is about 85% of our budget is in staffing and benefits. And so a reduction in local budget alone, supply budgets alone, will not address this. Um, that might be part of the strategy, but it cannot be the strategy. And so looking at um, positions through attrition, so as um, people retire or move, um, looking at whether or not we will um, refill or fill those positions. So uh, reductions through attrition, we're looking at campus and department budgets, um, not only for next year, but this year, how can we um, potentially reduce the, the local budget this year to further minimize the impact to fund balance class sizes, um, as we lose that ESSER funding and we've tried to keep those numbers lower than they had been in the past, um, class sizes would go up. We potentially would see an increase in class sizes um, in, some, in some areas. And then certainly we can look at outsourcing some of our services. That's proving to be a little more challenging to look at what would potential savings be there, but we're, we're beginning that work. Just not saying we're doing that, but just exploring that. Okay, so we asked Melissa when we, if we have to go below 20% uh, in fund balance, what, what are the implications for that for our first rating? So we wouldn't see it immediately. 
again, first ratings are always based on the previous year's uh, financial information. Uh, so it would probably be about two to three years out that we would start to see implications in our first rating. Um, some of those are difficult to project because it takes your actual data, but um, the ones that would affect us would be the, the average change in fund balance indicator and, of course, number of days of cash on hand, right? So as your fund balance uh, gets tighter, that kind of limits your, your cash on hand, um, and we would begin to drop from, um, you know, the upper nine, uh, 90 to 100s, we would begin to drop down to the 90s, down into the above standard achievement range um, if we were to realize um, the previous two projections that we showed you earlier. And for sake of time, we're going to jump to um, talking about, we're going to go through the next two slides very quickly. Um, the one previously was just to show you um, if we were to reduce local budgets like even by 5%, it would be a savings of about 1.3. So even if we did 10%, 2 million. Um, so that just um, further explains this can't be done by local funding alone. If you go to the next slide, this is just to show you payroll by function. So it just shows you where our um, staffing is located. Um, you can see um, from technology, going through to, you know, transportation, campus administration, all the way with that bottom line being um, staff coded for instructional purposes, which obviously is the majority of our, of our staff because of the nature of the work we do. So Melissa is going <clears> to <throat> talk more about budget assumptions as an action item in the board meeting, and that's the next slide. <coughs> and she has mostly talked through this. Um, we'll talk about this again during the, um, again, the action item in tonight's board meeting. So before we leave this, I want to make sure, is there <coughs> anything, Melissa, you want to highlight real quickly? Because we've talked about attendance, we'll values. About the enrollment attendance, uh, <coughs> property values increasing 8% um, for right now. Of course, a staff pay increase or other compensation right now is just to be determined. Uh, until we figure out what our next steps are. Right now, <coughs> campus allocations um, are projected to be about 1.9 million. Uh, they've already received their allocation, so they're currently in the planning process. And then, uh, if you'll remember, we do that set aside for facilities improvements. Generally, we do try to do a 1%. This past year, it was a million. Um, we're kind of plugging a hole of about a half a million dollars, just in case there's an air conditioning <coughs> that needs to be replaced or something of that nature just to try to just knowing that we're going to be limited on what we can do facilities wise going into next year's budget and then uh, you know the benefits for employees right now is still sitting at about four hundred uh, dollars per employee a month so we're going to have Todd jump into market comparisons because we left to be determined on compensation we wanted to share some data with you yeah, just want to show you how we compare in some of our positions. So your first uh, picture here, chart here, <clears throat> is a local teacher comparison. So it's, it's a comparison between Temple, Colleen, Coppers Cove, Georgetown, Waco, and, and Midway. We are the dotted red line um, going across the page there. And so we're really middle of the ground all the way um, at each experience level, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. Um, and you can see there at the 20-year mark, and we start making a little progress, um, kind of jumping over some districts that do not pay beyond 20 years or keep their salary constant at the 20-year level. Um, and we changed ours, I think it was uh, maybe last year, um, in paying individuals a greater salary between 20, 20 and 30 years. So again, middle of the road there is kind of what you see with, with the local teacher market on the next slide. I wanted to show a more regional area, and so when you look at our, our greater, I'll call it greater southern area, I mean, you can see the districts there on the right-hand side. Again, we're still kind of in the middle of the road. We're the dotted red line again. I'm still in the middle of the middle of the road between all those other districts. So this is our administrative professional local market comparison. Remember, we do a local one, and then we do a, a, a thirteen thousand to eighteen thousand enrollment one. Um, the green line that's going across that represents ninety percent of the market median. And so this this slide here is all about average pay and how we compare against the market median. And so if we're 100% if we're of the market median, that means as many districts above us 
are the same number of districts that pay below us. So, so we're at that 50 percent. That's right. <coughs> that's right. In the market. And so what this, what the graph is showing you, the, the colors of the on the on the bars, is that's a three-year comparison of kind of where we've been. So you can kind of see some progress that we've made um, over the years. You do see a dip in high school principal. I would say that's a that's due to some changes in, in leadership that we experienced last year. Um, and so um, that's that's the story with that one. Is going across, we, we are pretty strong with the administrative uh, professionals going across. <coughs> the next slide, <clears throat> kind of the same story. Um, we have um, seen some gains in some areas. Um, and I'm sorry, 13,000, 18,000 enrollment. And so have seen some gains in, in some areas um, going across there. LSSPs were at 89% of the market median. Um, when you look at the actual range of the positions, so the minimum and the maximum being paid, we're a little bit stronger in that area. Um, so I really think the 89% there is reflective of um, just kind of years of experience um, of our staff that, that currently hold those positions. Next slide. For our paraprofessional market comparison, remember with these, this is against the, the local comparison. So, you know, your, your Belton, um, Coppers Code, Colleen, Temple, Midway, Georgetown um, group. And so, the green line there, it's a little bit higher, right? It's at, it's at 100%. Remember, we paid the Social Security, um, which is different than most other districts around us. I think we're one of like 17 in the state of Texas to pay. Um, and so trying to be a little bit higher in those areas, you can see that we have made growth um, over the last three years um, in kind of how we compare um, and made some really good strides, um, like in our educational aids and special ed aids um, that you see there as well. With our auxiliary market comparison, same story, made a lot of progress over the last three years. <clears throat> uh, again, in each one of those, um, high school cafeteria managers, the elementary cafeteria managers, food service workers, a little bit stronger growth there. Uh, we were able to do a, a, a $2 increase uh, um, last school year um, to their hourly rate, and so you really see those um, stand out, and the other ones received a, a dollar increase last year. So just wanted to, to share just kind of where we were with salary increases and, and new position histories. And you can see that ranging all the way back from 2017 to 18, um, where we had a 2% increase and kind of what that dollar amount there was for that salary increase and then the dollar amount for the new positions um, that were added um, in that year. And then you see it ranging um, every year there. Um, 1920, which was pointed out with the House Bill 3, you can kind of see that that's that 5.8 to 9% teacher increase. Um, that we're required to give to, to maintain um, certain levels of, of regarding the funding that we received. Um, and so that was $4.8 million for that. And then the adding of the campuses, um, Lake Belton High School, um, you can kind of see that there in the 2021 year where we had $11, $11 million uh, for new positions. So. Next slide. And then I wanted just to kind of kind of give a an overview of kind of what it costs for a percentage of a salary increase, and so a one percent increase is about a million eighty-four thousand. So that'd be one percent across 1 the board. One percent across the entire board, um, and so that's one percent of midpoint um, for positions, and so two percent all positions, two percent of midpoint, um, be about two point almost two point two million dollars, and then kind of was thinking about last school year when we provided those um, flat dollar amount increase for pairs and auxiliaries, and kind of worked that into that to that third bullet point there. Um, that cost would be about $3.2 million. That last one there is really about um, higher years of experience for teachers and trying to, trying to do some differences there uh, when you get to, to teachers with 10, 15, 20 years of experience um, and more. Um, and so that's, that's the reason there for, for a little bit higher percentage. Um, and then maintaining the 2% admin professional and dollar an hour for Paris and that'd be about $4 million. On the next slide, in terms of the health insurance, we are anticipating a health insurance premium increase. Uh, I'm sorry, we anticipate a health, yes, we anticipate a health insurance premium increase from TRS Active Care. And so um, we do expect that to happen. We believe it'll be similar to what we've seen in the previous year, um, which was about an average increase of $58 per month. Um, and a cost of a $50 month per increase, month increase is about a million dollars. So when you think about the level of a salary increase being 1% and a $50 increase to cover the cost of health insurance, so moving our health insurance contribution up 50 bucks, it's roughly about the same dollar amount. And you impact 
14, 1,500 individuals um, in a TRS active care um, insurance premium contribution versus impacting every staff member with a 1% increase. Does that make sense? So, so I know we only have a couple of minutes. What I would like to say real quickly is what our approach is. So we wanted to have our conversation with you first. Um, we have a um, presentation, if you will, a state school finance, Texas school finance 101 presentation that we're going to be doing with all campuses and all departments, just making sure that everyone is well informed of um, the implications of what did or did not happen in the last legislative session in terms of impact to basic allotment and some of the things we've talked here today. Um, our approach on the slide that I showed you about how can we generate more revenue or reduce expenditures, there's not a set strategy. This is, was a brainstorming of strategies. Um, we've asked for input from campuses and departments or what are the ways in which um, they could reduce either local budget and or um, it, it, through attrition, staffing, um, again, departments first, that's where we started, and then we'll also be talking to campuses. And so within the next three weeks, we will be able to get to every campus and every department just to be really good communicators and make sure that everybody's um, up to speed with us on the current situation with school finance, really across the state, but particularly the implications for Belton ISD as we begin to um, work our work on trying to increase revenues and decrease expenditures. Questions? Comments? I know we've gone through a lot today. I've got a couple, but in the interest of time, I can ask them later. Okay. Okay. I could say a lot, but I guess we'll wait. Okay. So what we've talked about as a cabinet team is that just as school districts across the state in 2011 had to endure this and go through this without sufficient funding um, for basic allotment, we're in a similar spot now. Um, again, what we didn't show are the implications of what 19% inflation rate has had. We, we're not immune to that at all. Um, and so that's just an example. And so, but we will, um, go through this with our, I'm looking at our values and beliefs. We're going to hold those dear. We're still going to do great work for students in Belton ISD, um, but we have some very difficult discussions to have and decisions to, to make moving forward. But I think we've got a good team to make those decisions. So, Questions? And we'll be talking assumptions again in the um, board meeting this evening. Melissa will be back up talking to you about that. Okay. We can make some comments then. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, that Thank concludes. you, Todd. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Dice. That concludes our board workshop. There will be no further business. We are adjourned at 5.59.